artistic programs manager and local casting director at La Jolla Playhouse, La Jolla, La, La Jolla. I said, I was about to say La Jolla Kitchen. No, See? that's just where I work. That's not my identity. That's Jacole, not who I am. Jacole Kitchen. How you doing, Jacole? <laughs> Good, good, good. Glad to be here. Thanks, Ahmed. <laughs> you guys, we have a really great guest for you today. We're going to introduce her in just a moment. I just want to get a couple of announcements out of the way while you guys are still coming into the room or for those of you who are in the room. I uh, want to remind you, please make sure that you have your, your microphone muted and your, uh, and your camera off. And you also want to change your video settings to, uh, to make sure that you are not seeing non-video participants. So again, please make sure that your microphone is off and that your camera is off and that you only have um, the video participants selected on your screen. Uh, after our conversation tonight, we'll talk for about an hour or so. We'll have a question and answer period. Uh, if you're watching here on Zoom, please submit those questions via the chat. If you're on Facebook, again, please via, uh, submit those questions via the chat or the um, comment section and we'll get to as many of them as, as we can. Um, very quickly, just wanna make a couple of announcements of things going on here at San Diego Repertory Theater. Right now, you can still check out A Weekend with Pablo Picasso, written and performed by Herbert Sequenza, directed by Tim Powell and Todd Salovey. It's in film form. Head on over to sdrep.org and check it out. Herbert does a great, great performance as Pablo Picasso. You want to check it out. It is available for viewing through October 14th. So you have till next week to still check it out. Again, head on over to sdrep.org to get your tickets for that. We are also right now streaming Get Happy. Angela Ingersoll celebrates Judy Garland. It's an Emmy Award winning performance and uh, you definitely want to check it out. That actually uh, will be showing this Sunday. October 11th. And uh, the one other thing I want to mention to you is about our Stay and Play Online Book Club. For our next book, it is How to Be a Anti-Racist by Abram X. Kendi. And that will actually pair up with our Black Lives Matter reading series that we plan to produce in early 2021. Head on over to sdrep.org, sign up to become a book club member. Uh, we will be talking about that book on November 16th at 7 p.m. hosted by the library shop. With that being said, I'm going to flip things over to Jacole in case she has some announcements for y'all. Just please keep your eyes out on the La Jolla Playhouse website, uh, lajoyaplayhouse.org for our Digital WOW series. It continues uh, this month. We are officially in October. Yes. So this month you can still experience David Reynoso's Portaleza, which takes you to a portal to another dimension <laughs> and uh, a partnership with So Say We All, a spooky series of radio stories. Listen with the lights on. Oh. So please be sure to go to our website, uh, lahoyplayhouse.org, to check out all of the great digital WOW offerings. There you go. And I want you guys to know We Are Listening is continuing. Coming up on October 29th, uh, we wanted to skip October 15th because there was supposed to be a debate on that day. I don't know if there's going to be a debate on that day, but we're just going to go ahead and leave our schedule the same. So we will be skipping October 15th. And October 29th at 5.30 p.m., our guest will be Gamal Chastin. He is the organizer of the Breath Project. Uh, head on over to breathproject2020.org for more information. The actual 846 Breath Project Festival takes place on October 24th and 25th, and it is free. And then also on November 5th, Thursday, November 5th at 5.30 p.m., Kaya Dunn and Stephen Busher will be our guests here, and we are listening. So we invite you to come back. Head on over to sdrep.org slash listening to uh, sign up for those talks or again, watch on San Diego Rep's Facebook page. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into why y'all are here in the first place. We would like to introduce our very, very special guest today, award-winning actor, writer, Mrs. Carol Foreman is in the house. Come on into the room, Carol. I'm in the room <laughs> where it is happening. How are you doing, yes. Carol? I am I am doing really good. I'm good. really good. Thank you. Thank that's you. What that's what I'm talking about. That's what's up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for making this space. I had, I never would have imagined in all my life. <laughs> there could be a place, a magical place like this where black people could gather. 
and talk to each other. For I real. It's like, it's like Soul Train on Saturday mornings back in the oh, day. Oh, come on now. Doing all come on now. Stuff. Take me back. <laughs> Take me back, Ahmed. Well, Carol, it's I my- gave everybody a brief introduction, but as always in, in We Are Listening fashion, we like we like to hear from you yourself. Why don't you go ahead and give the audience, for those who don't know you, just go ahead and give them a little rundown of how you got into the performing arts and kind of a synopsis of how we got where we are today. All right, have a seat, <laughs> have a drink, light up a cigarette. Um, so I was born in Morocco, Africa. Uh, my father was in the military, they were stationed there. And uh, we moved all over until I was about 14 years old. We moved every two years, um, spent a, a couple of years in elementary on Coronado Island, uh, going to school there and moved back in the 70s and walked onto campus on Sarah High School in Terra Santa Murphy Canyon. And um, it was the first time I wasn't the only black face in a crowd. And I thought I've found my people. And uh, I got into a uh, seventh grade, I had a reader's theater and a puppetry class, you know, because I there were hippies teaching in drama in high school those days. So we had a great time. And uh, so those were really formative years for me. You know, um, my uh, high school acting teacher, Susan Shattuck, introduced us to Shakespeare. It just blew my mind. We were doing the uh, competitions at Chapman College the classical competitions at 15. I auditioned for the Old Globe Theater. They had a summer youth training program with Eric Christmas at the time, uh, with Marcy Maddox, who was a speech uh, dialect coach. And I got cast as Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which we did at the Marquee Theater and at in the park at Balboa Park. And, and it was the first time someone told me that I was good. And Eric was this British guy who would curse at you, you know, when he was angry and when he liked you. And so he terrified me. So I had to believe him. He said, I said, he would say, you're good. And I was like, oh, thanks to you. He goes, no, damn it. You're, you're good. You're good. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. And uh, so spent a lot of, and no one ever asked me what I wanted to do all through high school. I was just writing shows and performing and having fun and performing in classrooms, taking over classrooms. And uh, then uh, when I was graduating, you know, my family said, well, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I I have no idea. Well, maybe you should do computers and really discovered I am not going to do computers. And uh, I, uh, I traveled with up with people, um, came back, was recruited by uh, admissions at USIU they saw me dancing in a show, so they assumed I was a dancer. So I went to USIU on a dance scholarship and was really miserable because I really wanted to be acting. <laughs> and then I got ca- my uh, uh, acting teacher said, hey, there's this musical called Little Shop of Horrors that they're doing at the rep and they need, you know, another black actor singer. So I auditioned and got it and I was working and I was around working actors and I bugged those poor actors like constantly. How did you do this? Where did you train? And so I dropped out of college and ran away to LA with $50 and my suitcase and my dad gave me the car and I slept on floors and I delivered sandwiches to day traders in downtown LA to pay for my rent. And uh, that was in 1989 and I've been in LA ever since. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I, I first met you when I started working here at the rep, I started working here at the rep in 2007. And I was just here in that brief window when you were here. And I remember (laughs) I was, I was, I was, yeah, it was a brief window, but I was a fan ever since. Oh man. I remember you would go to the box office and I just remember your, this voice. I was like, Ooh, what is, Ooh, it was like the Pied Piper. Who, where is that? Ooh, man. Why are you just here in the box office? You you should be on radio, man. You should be famous. What is that voice? Yeah, you know, I, I I made it work. I did some recordings for the phone system and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, not even an inch of your potential and your talent. It was wasted. <laughs> well, you know, um, again, you know, the main reason Sam started this is because he wanted to, um, you know, as a lot of people do, they wanted to hear for, from us. You know, this is a time where, you know, along with COVID making everybody sit still, And then on top of that, uh, going into all of the, you know, exasperation from all the racial strife we've had this summer, you know, it just seemed like, you know, it just seemed like that wall was hit. And like I always said, everybody made the statements, right, from 
theaters to Nike to Amazon to this that like everybody made the statements and now they they want to hear from black folks so here we are you know what I mean um what, what how how are how are you I wonder how are you feeling right now because this is like this is this is a rough time for everybody like this is a rough mental time for everybody with just everything going on with COVID to the election to our industry being like decimated right now, just about in every aspect of it and everybody's fight. How are, how are you feeling right now? How are you doing? I'm devastated. Yeah. Emotionally. Yeah. Sad, angry, furious, heartbroken. Um, afraid in this current political climate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. People are still killing our black men. Yeah. You know, and w- and without remorse, cavalier attitude, the person <laughs> in charge it's uh, of this country. It's it's watching the worst reality show I've ever seen. It's hor- yeah. it's horrifying. And it's interesting, we used to do experiments uh, like this in high school about how fascism could take over, how it could happen anywhere. And we've been primed for it for a long, long time. Racism has never gone anywhere in this country. It was founded. It's one of the founding principles of of the United States of America. It's ingrained in our institutions, in our education, in our culture, in our language. So it's come to a head and this is our reckoning. Yeah. This is the ugly reality of our legacy that's come home to roost. And it's, it's going to be a long road if we, don't let, if we don't let the worst of us, of ourselves, take over and destroy each other because we really do need each other black people built this country who are you fooling Mm. we created this economy what are you talking about people from asia southeast asia latin america you know when the work that people don't want to do the dirty work the real nuts and bolts feeding us caring for our children, you know, who, who's going to, you ain't going to do your own work. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) What are you talking about? And then, you know, the excuse that you, you, you know, we're less than, we're not valuable. We're not human beings. Come on, come on. I don't, I don't understand that mentality. It's evil to me. It's, it's evil. And, uh, yeah, you know, and our you vice president that's uh, going, uh, the vice president going on and saying no, that that that's not part of the foundation of this country. That's not so. There's the people that are still able to deny that that's what this country was built on. Lying with impunity. Yeah. Now there's just no shame in the lying. Lying to our faces. The fly was trying to tell us. I was expecting the the exorcist music to come in in the background. Save yourselves while you can. (laughs) Well, and, and, you know, the same reckoning that we're going through in this country. And like you said, this has always been there. Uh, There's a a new light that's being shown on it. Um, But the same is true for our industry. Sure. That that this is and and there's still a deniability about that as well and and how much it exists in the industry and how much the industry was founded on it and we were talking a little bit before um, before we came on 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 camera and just chatting a little bit about kind of the same way we had to bite our tongues about what's going on in the world for so long that, that we had to just put our heads down and and keep going we were talking about that that's something that you've had to experience for decades in this industry can yeah. you talk about that a little bit sure um one thing that i learned to deflect racism or any type of violence 
towards me or my brother was humor. Uh, uh, Self-deprecating humor, being silly, being, you know, people maybe think I'm flighty or, you know, very surfacy, but that it's my first go-to. Um, and I got into performing because I realized if I made people laugh, they would like me and were less likely to hit me. Um, on Coronado Island, um, my brother and I spent formative years there and we, we, were, we would get jumped by the kids. We were the only black kids in the school system at the time. Um, I had a teacher, I think in third and fourth grade, there was a, a little elementary school as you come over the bridge on the right. Uh, the rest of the class was reading Tom Sawyer and, and I was reading Dick and Jane. Um, she wouldn't give me the same books. And so my parents had a PTA meeting and uh, my parents said, well, you know, my, our daughter's going to the library checking out these books that are advanced for her reading level. Why are you giving her Dick and Jane? And the teacher said, well, it's a scientific fact that blacks are athletically inclined and your daughter should not waste her time pursuing academics. So after they pulled my mother off of her, we, my brother and I were transferred to the Catholic school, Sacred Heart on Coronado Island. And uh, we were, my brother and I were on the bus coming home from school one day, they dropped us off at the uh, military base because uh, that's where we lived at the time. We were in officer's housing. And I saw a group of young white boys uh, jumping my brother who was like in second grade or something. And these were junior high school kids. So I'm running off the bus to try to help my brother and one of the kids puts out his leg and you know how high those steps are on the buses. So I went right down and knocked the wind out of me and I passed out and they took me to the hospital. Um, so, uh, you know, my parents of course got the news media and everyone in, but that being said, you know, um, so that's after that incident we were transferred. And then, you know, I, was, I would watch Bugs Bunny cartoons and try to do imitations and I would entertain, you know, my classmates there and get out of fights by just starting to tell jokes and acting a fool basically. So that was my early kind of way of protecting myself from that kind of hurt. And then of course, you know, acting, you know, a lot of us as young artists, you know, feel that we can hide behind this art, but you know, the more you investigate and the more that you love this process, the more you, have to just engage yourself at a certain point you you have to come to terms with all of these things so the, the, that was um you know i guess kind of what informed a lot of uh of, of why i became a performer and you have your career has spanned it all i mean musicals plays classics you have you've covered the gambit as far I mean you look at your tv film like your resume is is quite impressive oh thank um, you <laughs> but do you do you still feel yourself being I mean it's two different questions but do you still feel yourself being pigeonholed and 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 gaslit within this community or within the industry within the industry within the community so yeah it's a couple of different things well first of all you know film and tv you're going to be pigeonholed, you know, uh, because it's product, you know, and there's a lot of money at stake. Casting, I mean, you've been in casting, you understand, you want to be able to look at a picture and go, oh, this is the mother, oh, this is the, the romantic lead. And so that's already just part of it. And part of it is just coming to terms with how you look and who your type is. And, and so I've learned to compartmentalize when it comes to the business. It's like, okay, I'm looking, I'm, you know, I'm a 50 plus actor now, and I'm, you know, let's fight ageism. It's okay to tell your age. <laughs> I'll be yeah. 55 in November, so suck it. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, now, but for Hollywood, it used to be like, if you were 40 and up, it's like between 40 and death. So I had these young 20 something year old managers, you know, who are sending me out for 60 and 70 year olds. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You know, that's, that's not me, but but it's all and it's also kind of a strange thing that they're doing in, in Hollywood, too, where they seem to be skewing those ages a little younger. And so I think my managers were being strategic because I was starting to book those roles like the grant, you know, so now I'm going out mm. for the mothers and the grandmothers mm. and, the, you know, the, el, you know, that's Hollywood for theater. I'm still cute, you know, and I can, <laughs> you know, I'm theater cute, you know, I can, you know just barely do some of those leading lady roles, you know, like probably five years ago, I just 
barely was able to do Esther in Intimate Apparel. Like, who? <laughs> then the next year I played Mrs. Hicks, you know, the, the, the matron in the group. So it's, it's just funny to me, you know, perception. Um, in terms of, of race, I mean, I came up, I hit LA in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. Non-traditional casting, colorblind casting was all the thing. And I was, I was snatching up the work left and right. I was having a ball, you know. Uh, I look at, there was something that was online the other day. I'm like, ooh, I can't tell people I did that because, <laughs> you know, that would not go down today. <laughs> I was having a ball doing it, you know. And, be, you know, it's, and theater was, and commercials were the first to do that. Not film and TV, but it was always theater. And then commercials were the first to kind of cast interracial couples and you know more people of color um uh you know because they're every once in a while you and uh julia flores was a casting director in la who was really mm -hmm. i mean you know because you worked with her you yeah. jacole was uh one of my agents early on you know kind of so we were just kind of crossing paths like this uh before um i left the agency so um i got a lot of work i mean i was the first african-american to do a lot of things to play sally bowles in cabaret to do tanya in mamma mia when they did it in vegas um uh to originate roles at oregon shakespeare festival and shows and and this sort of thing so um it's it's a lot of uh a lot of things that i feel proud of um but then i've noticed a shift the past 15 years where people had become more resistant to it is like so the pendulum was this way is like yes let's everyone include it and then you know i started to notice more resistance to it i i, I was uh, up for a role in quorum boys that was on broadway when i was in new york with uh with with laurie from ksa at the time and uh uh, uh, it was a British director and I was really excited about the show, but it, but the, the show itself had to do specifically with race and they wanted to cast me as the matron of this orphanage. And the idea is that this young African was coming to the orphanage. And I think Uzo Adobo ended up doing it. So the casting was really excited about me and they wanted to bring me back to meet the director. So, you know, like, okay, I'm coming in. And then as soon as I walked into the room, it was just this icy feel it's just kind of like mm, okay something you know I'm not feeling the love okay but because you know you never know what you're auditioning for so you just like I did my research I did my best and so the director's like so you know we're, we've decided to cast non-traditionally because you do that thing here in America and I thought okay here we go <laughs> here we go and she goes, well, so what do you feel about the part? And I said, well, you know, I think it's really interesting that you're casting non-traditionally, you know, because certainly there is colorism within the black community. So that might be kind of interesting to explore. And she just looked very confused by <laughs> my statement and said, well, let's just get into it. So she and the casting director get up to read with me and they're really acting. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> we're doing this. And so I leave the room and I thought, well, that was weird, but whatever. But I had a flight to get back because I had to head back to Vegas. And then my agent calls me and said, so how do you feel it went? And I said, well, it was kind of odd. I said, I felt I did good work. And they said, well, the director said you came into the room with a chip on your shoulder about race. Okay. Of course. And, and yeah, and, uh, you know, deflecting, make it, and it just really upset me. And it just, you know, what's the slap in the face? You know, I came in with the love, I did my work, you know, and, 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 but that's part of the thing is it's hard not to sometimes think that, well, you know, you start to question yourself because that's our first go to, or my first go to was like, it was something that I did that was wrong. And it wasn't about them. They, she just didn't want to cast a black actress in that role. And I do understand because it really would shift the dynamic of the story. And I personally feel that if it's central to the story, the author really should have that final say in how they're casting it. If they are going to introduce something that changes that dynamic, then you have to have the conversation about it. And that's also probably going to affect the writing of it. Um, what I have a hard time with is someone wanting to cast me or trying to fit me in a place where I'm not wanted 
and or if they just don't want to have the conversation. Um, and Tias was trying to cast me as Hedda and Hedda Gabler. So I, they kept bringing me back to the callback. And it was obvious the director did not want me. And he's, he kept forgetting my name for some reason, you know, even though I'd been in there like two, a couple of times. <laughs> and I thought, he just doesn't want me. And, uh, but the artistic directors did, but I just knew, you know, you're not gonna change his mind. And also, are we gonna have this next Swedes? Cause I was in Sweden and I have met them, they are there. So, <laughs> and I speak a little Swedish, which is obscure fact, but that's another story. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, be willing to have the conversation about it. And sometimes white directors and artistic directors are afraid to, to ask the question. And it's, and it's, I'm not offended by it. Uh, I welcome it because now it's like, we can go deeper with that. And also I'm just kind of, it's like, can't we just write plays for, for folks that look like us? Why are you always trying to fit us into, and the whole idea of tradition? Well, what is the tradition? The uh, tradition is Western white European theater. And that's in our training, that's in the plays, you know, in the canon of, you know, everything that, you know, our industry is built on, um, is this tradition of, of, of a Eurocentric uh, of, uh, uh, institution of a, of, a, of a legacy. And, uh, and that's fine, but I, I want to know about you know, other traditions and other writers and other authors and other stories that are reflective of my experience. You know, it's funny uh, when Mink and Wilts was on here and we kind of had that conversation and, and we had kind of took it, we had kind of took it to, um, we had kind of took it to uh, kind of a, a hip hop sense mm -hmm. because hip hop wasn't, it wasn't a creation of anybody else. It, it, it came organically. And what Mika was trying to get to was that exactly what you're saying of what the tradition of theater has been taught as to what it is or what it has been or where it came from but you yeah. know what Mika will want to look for is like somehow to be able to foster that organic yeah. theater out of the black experience something that's not informed by this tradition or that tradition just yeah. as hip-hop was does that it, of course later on it got co-opted we know that but just <laughs> just yeah. just the fact that you know, to see black theater be able to, again, come from that organic space from within itself, from the black people within itself, how they express themselves, how they communicate, how they tell the stories, how those mm -hmm. things are related. We, we kind of had that conversation in, um, we kind of had that conversation in the meeting today about like going forward, like what is the, you know, you know, what has to change as far as when we're putting these black stories on stage, like what, what has to change to get the authentic person, the authentic characters, the authentic mood, the authentic neighborhood, the authentic feel, what is it really going to take for when a majority of the theater leaders are white and don't understand mm. what it takes to really reach that authenticity. Like, nah, that dude ain't gonna say that like that. No, she is not gonna respond to him like that. It is not going down, you know, just right. about the things. Right, it's gonna take the financial resources and the support and the training, you know. Um, you know, where the commissions for, you know, uh, the workshops, uh, the, the uh, you know, the support, you know, they know what it takes to move a, a white author, th author through development and to continue to throw money at a project that maybe isn't working, but if enough money goes yeah. into it, they'll somehow make it work, right. you know? And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've had two projects, uh, one uh, uh, an urban opera I've been writing based on Shakespeare's Anthony and Cleopatra about the crack cocaine epidemic in Southeast San, uh, Los Angeles. So that was the inspiration for it. And I had submitted it to the public theater uh, back in 08. And one of the uh, dramaturgs got back to me and said, this is really fascinating. I want to see it. And uh, he said, send me the script. And he says, well, when you're in New York, let's have a meeting. And so I happened to be in New York later that year. And we sat down and he said, you know, the only reason I'm not passing this on is that no one uh, knows if hip hop is going to succeed 
on Broadway and in front of a white audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, of course, I see Victor Chan. How you doing, Victor? And uh, and uh, you know, you know, fast forward. But they and they were developing a piece called Venice that the taper mm. was doing at the time um, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. Othello and about terrorism, and it just kind of didn't go anywhere. And uh, you know, then along that comes wasn't in. hip hop's fault. No, it was not. <laughs> a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you know, and 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 it's and it's true, you know. So everyone, you know, the egos and and the, all the money that's at stake, you know, for it, everyone has to have their fingers in the pie, you know. So I've definitely gone through this with a couple of projects. So um, I actually just got a residency. New Musicals Inc. has made a a commitment to nurturing black writers, specifically black writers writing musical theater. So that pool is even smaller. So they came to me say, will you head up this program to help us recruit black writers and to be an artist in residence yourself? Not only that, we'll pay you to be here. I'm like, you know, where, where, when do I go? When, how soon can I get there? So I'm, I'm out, you know, doing my search about, you know, and talking to people. And then, you know, they're think, talking about, you know, let's get students and develop young people. And I said, that's great. And I said, but we have this handful of extraordinary talent who are in workshop hell. You know, because for a while, theaters were getting all of this grant money to, you know, kind of prop up their diversity. See, we are workshopping all these plays and, oh, look, we've got a Latin, let, uh, you know, Latina playwright, or we've got, you know, Asian playwright, or we've got black playwrights, but it would stop there. You know, nothing like a page to stage development thing, you know, it just would kind of linger in workshop forever or concerts and no commitment to production. So I came back and I said, you know, can we just give a space for, and not only just the workshop, but make the commitment to giving us resources uh, for the business. We want your connections for production opportunities because they have these things already established where they, they have a, a group of producers that come in to do these one-on-ones with writers and, uh, and also um, um, creating partnerships between them and theaters who are looking for shows because not everything has to go to Broadway, y'all. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything is, is meant to be on Broadway. And there are regional mm -hmm. theaters that are hungry for new work. And also if the regional theater has had an experience of developing good plays you know, and, uh, and of educating their audiences to say, you know, it doesn't always have to be a Broadway show. You know, this is something that's up and coming or just letting the audience you know, engendering that trust. And that takes time and that takes the relationships and the developments. And another thing with theaters too, it's always bothered me is, you know, the once or twice a year where they do the shows of color and then they want you to read a chat to those communities and then ignore them for the rest of the year. You know, you know, and you wonder why people of color aren't showing up to your shows. You know, you know, we, you know, we know. <laughs> so this is an undeniable segment, uh, segue into something that I know we want to make sure that we have some time to talk about um, as far as just creating and writing our own stuff, which is something obviously you have done. And as you mentioned, Carol, um, we were sort of ships in the night at the agency. Carol, when I first came to the agency, again, Carol was one of my first introductions to uh, professional Black theater artists because she was one that we represented. Um, but by the time I was coming up as a junior agent, you were shifting already into writing and Princess and the Black IP was something that you were working on. And Carol, I will, I, I, I would love to hear your perspective because um, obviously I've, I've now worked at the rep, Ahmed has worked at the rep, but I will never ever forget being on a phone call from you. We, uh, there was a bit of distance of us representing you as an, an actor but the relationships were still there. And I remember you called for Victoria and, and I, I took the phone call and you just said, I need help. Yeah, I need help. Something that is mine is being taken from me and I need help. And I, I will, I'm getting chills thinking about it now because I, I can picture exactly where I was at my desk. I will never forget that phone call. Yeah. Um, so I, 
Can you talk about what was going on on the other end of that call? Again, now as a writer, somebody who is now setting out to create, you have a space at a theater for, at a, a theater that is a home theater of yours that you yeah. consider an artistic home. Um, can you talk about what was going on on the other end of that call? Yes. Um, or can I? Yes, it was, you it, can. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it was so traumatic, Jacol. It still feels like an out-of-body experience. Um, I still go through th therapy um, or just started it because I didn't realize how traumatic it was and how much of a block it had been creating for me in even wanting to continue pursuit. And the thing was, I reached out to help for everyone. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Dia Hurston. For sure. Who really saved me. And I know there were a lot of people who felt helpless to help me. But I remember she inviting me over to her home with a group of other women, uh, writers, uh, and they just sat with me and listened to me. And I cried and I screamed and I yelled. I talked to uh, a writer friend of mine who has a show on Broadway now. And uh, when I was in New York, cause I got ambushed by my team <clears throat> the producer and the director and my writing partner, we were uh, going into a casting session in New York. And a half hour before actors were supposed to be in the room, they said, Carol, we don't think you're a good enough writer and we need you off the, the piece. You know, we need someone with a name. <clears throat> and I was like, what are you talking about? The interesting thing about that was a month earlier, the producer had come to me and said, you know, your writing partner isn't a good enough composer. We need someone, you know, who's more experienced, has a name, and you know, we're not really feeling the music. And I'm like, okay, we've won a Richard Rogers Award, a John Larson Foundation grant, Edgerton Foundation grant gave us money with my script and his music. And okay, what's that about? <laughs> um, so, uh, so my friend, you know, I called my friend, he said, well, congratulations, when you have producers wanting to steal your work, that means they feel like they're going to make a lot of money off of your piece. And this is very typical, especially in commercial theater. Um, they basically said, uh, what did the, the intern at the public theater, he said to me, you know, musical theater is a blood sport. Mm -hmm. And he was not lying. So, uh, you know, we, we, I had to agree to, or I agreed to meeting the other writers. They had lined up for me in New York. So they bring in this young white man that I have a meeting with in this private country club because the producer always, you know, had to have a stage for his meetings to show us how much money he had. And uh, the writer said, well, I've read the script and he said, it's structurally, it's great. And he said, I honestly don't, <laughs> no, how could I could speak from a black female point of view because this is what the show is. And so they quickly hurried him out of the room. So they decided, well, we got to get a, a black female writer, you know, to, you know, do whatever this is. So it was, there, so much happened. I'm trying to organize my thoughts uh, around this. Um, of any case, uh, at one point, I was going to pull the show. You know, I, I, I could see, I was like, this is gonna be really ugly. Uh, you know, because everyone was on a different page. It wasn't a team. It was everyone fighting for a piece of something. I lived in Vegas for five years and there's something I call Vegas fever where people kind of come and, you know, they're excited about all the hedonistic things that they can do when they're in Vegas and the money. And that was a look in everyone's eyes. They had Broadway fever. You know, they were talking about all these Japanese producers that were lining up to you know, make it, you know, and all these Broadway names, you know, I wanted to use more San Diego local talent. And, you know, the producers were like, well, no, you know, we've got to have Broadway names or people who have Broadway credits and they have to be from LA and they have to be from New York. And I'm like, y'all ain't got the budget for this. I don't know how you're going to pull it off, but good luck. And uh, so the director sent me, faxed me 
20 pages of what he wanted me to write. So he basically sent me his own version of the show. Um, the producer wanted, you know, as many new people that they wanted. And uh, so at, at a certain point I said, I'm gonna pull the show. And then Sam from the rep called me and said, Carol, Carol, you, you, can't, you can't pull the show. And I said, it, it's just, he said, I, I promise you, I promise you, I am going to do the show that you wrote. He drove up to my house, sat on my couch in my living room and Sam said, you know, I, he said, if you, if you pull the show, my theater will go out of business. He said, think of all the actors who won't get paid. He says, I've got staff that, you know, I won't be able to pay and, you know, there's pension and health. And, and he's like, we, we really need this show to happen. And because of that, because of my re long relationship with Sam, you know, cause I've been doing shows there since I was in college, I said, okay. And I didn't pull the show. Next thing I know, I had to go into the hospital. I had surgery. I had a hysterectomy. Sam and the director and the producer and my writing partner are meeting with my lawyer, trying to find ways of getting me off of the project. They're sending me flowers in the hospital. <laughs> I had my doctor throw them in the trash. Um, I get another lawyer because my lawyer's assistant called me up because I still wanted to pull the show. And she said to me, the, uh, um, they're going to do their own version of the show, whether or not you're a part of it. So don't even try to make trouble. Producer would call me threatening me. You know, if you disparage me, you know, you're going to get a bad reputation in this business. No one will want to work with you again. People will see you as difficult. Um, you know, you might as well kiss your career goodbye. Uh, Sam banned me from rehearsal, even though my contract said I'm supposed, I have every right to be at rehearsal. He called me and he left a message on my machine saying, you know, um, I'm, I'm not telling you not to come to rehearsal, but it would be best if you, you didn't. And, and the director says you, you can't be there. Um, so it was, uh, finally I got my own lawyer. And so I thought, okay, if they're gonna take it, they're gonna pay me. So according to our contract, upon initial production of a show, my writing partner and I were supposed to split $10,000. Okay. I signed off on it. <clears throat> no, I said, uh, okay, if that's the agreement, great. The producer comes back and says, oh no, that was a mistake. So he basically sends us another agreement saying, we'll get $2,500 to split. And by the way, there's a gag order attached to this. You can't speak in any way disparagingly about the show or any way that will affect my ability to produce it. My writing partner signs off on it. I didn't. I said, no, the contract says $10,000. Oh, he called me up and <laughs> called me all kinds of names. I finally got another lawyer because it was a conflict of interest for my writing partner and me to be with the same lawyer because it got really messy. I had four different contracts. Uh, someone referred me to, uh, I think it was Carol Rainey, referred me to uh, a lawyer, a wonderful guy named Greg Thompson in New York. And he said, this is really a mess. He said, well, I'm gonna help you because this is, he says, I've never seen anything like this. This is wrong. Uh, he got me my money. I was probably the only one to make any money off of the show, but <laughs> then my writing partner called me up and said he was entitled to the half of the money. Uh, my last conversation with him was, you know, I asked him why, you know, he's, you know, after all the work we're doing, why, is he basically stabbing me in the back and leaving? And he says, it's not personal, Carol, it's business. And he hung up on me. And so uh, he said, well, uh, why should I be punished? Why should I be punished? And I said, well, you know, if you want to pay half my lawyer's fees, you know, I'm well, happy to split it with you. He goes, well, I don't think that's fair. And I said, well, it's not personal, it's business, Click, you know. So, um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. And, uh, and it was, it was just really hard, hard. Uh, 
I, I know, and I know it was dysfunctional from hearing things from the cast and things that were happening in the script that were just ridiculous. You know, I wanted the celebration of black culture and the idea of uh, seeing representation. I'd never seen a black princess before. This was well before the Disney version. Um, actually, Disney had seen my piece before uh, at the ASCAP Disney Musical Theater Workshop. And uh, uh, we were talking to one of the assistants there and they're saying, well, does Disney have any intention of doing any other uh, musicals or films about, you know, black princes or princesses? And the, uh, the assistant said to me, oh, no, 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 Disney's already done Africa when they were talking about Lion King. So, mm -hmm. so it's just, you know, the pervasiveness of this, you know, people don't, are people really listening to what they say? You know, and then they, they kind of turned it into, you know, so as far as I was concerned, they just turned it into this kind of minstrel show. You know, I would get copies of the script. I would have to sign off on authorizing the script. And I would just cry when I wrote it because there was nothing of the dignity that I felt was important as part of the production. It was, you know, just a lot of gross stereotypes and caricatures and bad writing. You know, they tried to rewrite a show that we had worked on for more than eight years in two months. It was like, you, you can do that, but it's not gonna be very good. And then obviously it just never went anywhere. And I got all the rights back, but then I dissolved my um, uh, part, uh, I dissolved my collaboration agreement with my partner. And I'm still here. Hey, Carol, real quickly, she can't get into the Zoom call, but uh, Dia is watching on Facebook. She wanted me to hey. make sure you knew that she was here watching. Wow. <laughs> Love you, Dia. So I just want to follow up on, you know, the, the person who said, you know, don't, you don't do this. You, uh, it's going to ruin your career, the, the repercussions, meh, meh, meh. Um, obviously, sitting here listening to you tell the story, there are emotional repercussions, 100%. Um, obviously, you're, I, I, from my standpoint, your career is doing just just fine, I would say. Yeah. Um, but what can, what were the repercussions for you? And and I, I guess I am thinking more in the emotional, in the personal, in the relationship. What what were the repercussions of this? Um, well, I never set foot back at the rep since then. Um, it was uh, it, it, 2008, 2009, my life fell apart in a lot of things. I almost lost the desire to do anything in terms of the the creative arts. I didn't want to write. I didn't want to sing. I didn't want to I didn't want to do any performance. I didn't want it, an association with any of it. And I, I lapsed into, I started to have horrible panic attacks. I couldn't drive my car over bridges. Mm -hmm. um, I would go into a flop sweat. I would start screaming and crying. I would pull off on the side of the road. Every once in a while, it'll, it'll hit me still. I went to a hypnotherapist to help me through it and it helped a lot, uh, but it happened on the 105 freeway. I um, was coming from my then uh, now husband's uh, house in Long Beach and I was coming off the 710 to make that 105 and I just, it was like a bridge. I also couldn't walk across a bridge. I had this horrible feeling that I was just going to fall through the ground. And uh, so it was debilitating. I would, you know, I would have to plan out my routes. I always made sure that there, there was never a bridge. And I came down to San Diego going over that overpass, the 805 and the eight. I just, I would just freak out, just couldn't, I would have to call up someone to talk me over because I, I was hysterical. Um, I also started, I had horrible bouts of vertigo. I woke up one morning and the whole room started spinning. So I was having these physical manifestations of just terror and fear. Um, uh, I lost both of my homes at the time. I had a house in Vegas and a house in downtown LA because I moved back to uh, uh, LA for work. And that was when the writer's strike happened and the threatened actor's mm -hmm. strike. And uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I started out slowly. I was working with Ruff Yeager uh, on another piece, the Venus Hottentots Extreme Makeover, and we were also invited to do uh, a Disney ASCAP thing. 
Um, and then years later, I, I got back into writing a children's musical with Carol Weiss, who was my manager and agent, and she retired and we started writing together and we wrote a children's musical. So I would do things that were kind of small, you know, low risk. And then I started to go back to the Anthony and Cleopatra piece. I had a reading with playwright Serena in LA. Um, but then I felt, I found myself going so far and then stopping. It's like this, this new musical that I'm recommitting to, which is, I have this wonderful composer. He's been after me for three years to write this show with him. It's like, you know, it's like dating or something. It's like, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested. Um, and, and it's been hard for me to get back. And so I decided, you know, because it's, because I realize when you're, putting out things I, I I love to write for other people and I think about all the the act you know I think about people like Lilius White who loved Princess and the Black Eyed Pea and championed it and knew that that was going to be her big thing to do again in New York and uh, just all the talent that we've had along the way and I felt like I let down a lot of people you know it's hard enough to get our stuff done. And then I felt like I failed at something because when you get an opportunity like that, it's, it's hard enough to get a show produced, but then to have something that had such promise and such potential just kind of crash and burn, it's, it's kind of devastating. And I don't know if it's something I'll ever get over, but I, I know I'm, I'm, but I'm learning how to manage it better. So I don't stop myself from, uh, really engaging in what I was put here to do, I feel like, you know, in my work and, and employing my friends and creating something that touches people and, and moves people. You know, I am an artist and, and, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's a disservice to myself to allow, uh, to allow the nasty things that other people have done to me to get in my, the way of my own greatness, <laughs> you know, I deserve better. Yes, you do. Ahmed, you're on mute. It's, uh, it's, it's strange hearing you recount that because like I said, that, that was when I had just walked in the door here. And I was, you know, I was, I, at the time I just needed a gig. I just walked in here selling tickets. I was working in the box office part-time <laughs> and, you know, it's it, like I said, it's, it's so strange to hear you recount all that because as I go back in my time machine, for me, just starting here and kind of just being in the box office, it's just like, it was just like echoes of things, but you don't really know what's going on and you don't you don't even know enough to know enough to know to ask anybody what's going on because <laughs> right. you don't even know what people are, you don't even know anything about what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I would begin to hear things later and later and later. And you kind of like, it's like, I was here at that time, but I have no idea what, I don't know what was happening, you know? And when me and you spoke on the phone, you know, and, um, you know, I first got first again, I want to say thank you very much for coming to talk to us and coming to talk to us here yes. on this platform. Yes. Like, I really want to thank you for that, you know, and, and, you know, I want to make clear to everybody that, you know, part of the reason that we all do this, including freedom from the old globe, the reason we all agreed to do this is because it would be 120% real, you know, it would be 120% real conversations, no matter, no matter what, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah. you know, I just want to let you know that, you know, from the leadership here, it was a thing of like, no, Carol needs to come on and tell her story. There's, 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 there's things that went wrong. There's things that were done wrong. And Carol needs to be in this space to tell her side of what happened. And so I just want to again say to you, thank you for answering that phone call. Thank you for agreeing to come on this space and share your story, especially with all the people that love you that are watching right now, you know, I, again, I, I just want to just at this moment to say thank you for number one, thank you for being vulnerable. I'm not talking to you, Siri. Thank you for being. <laughs> <laughs> Siri's always up in somebody's business. <laughs> right. Thank you for being, thank you for being vulnerable, but at the same time, so strong to come on and talk to us about that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah.
for I sure. appreciate the the time to be able to uh, saying it in a place where I felt I have been heard. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's important because this is not an old story and it's not a new story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we, you know, we were just talking about like John Boyega from Star Wars going through what he's <laughs> going through with Joe Malone and the thing that he created for that company and watching wow. the whole thing get flipped and taken from him. And like, this is not an old story. It's not a new story. It's an ongoing story. It's an ongoing narrative, which I'm hoping that these discussions will open the eyes of people in our industry at all levels to understand, you know, even if it's what, what, Jacole, what was the term that Sheldon used? I can't remember, but something ignorance. I can't remember when I was asking him, like, is this willful? He, I can't remember. I have to go back and, but Sheldon, as articulate as he is, of course, he just had this, you know, just this term that just, I can't even remember what it was, but it was just, just some kind of ignorance term, like not a willful mm -hmm. ignorance at times, but sometimes just this ignorance that comes from being in a thing for so long and the way a thing operates that it just becomes just the way it goes. And people mm -hmm. become callous and unfeeling or unaware that they're operating in that way. You know what I mean? So I'm yeah. hoping like, you know, like you and like we had Bill Wright on here a few weeks back to mm. come on and talk about these things so people understand that this is what's happening. This is what's going on. And there are real, you know, there are real, this, this, this is art. This comes from our heart. This comes from what we, this is, comes from our being, you know, and I think sometimes that gets forgotten that this stuff comes, stuff comes out of our souls. And it's, it's a tricky thing, too, because we're also talking about the commercialization of art. And, you know, these are supposedly non-for-profit theaters who are trying to behave like commercial entities. Mm. And um, that's a whole other beast. You know, I mean, the non-profit is about, is, was supposed to be a, a safe place for artists, for nurturing artists, for developing artists, and for showcasing. Um, and it also makes me wonder, you know, I'm looking forward to the day when we have our own agency over our own productions instead of looking outside to someone else or to something else to validate our work. It's, I, I think, you know, for me personally, I'm, you know, interested in going beyond that. In the meantime, here we are. How are we going to build that? Right, right. How about as we look for tonight, and I want to be mindful because I know you have, I know you have rehearsal tonight. So I want to be mindful of, of your schedule and your time. I've got about, I've got about till 5.30, 5.45. Okay. okay. That's, that's perfect. Um, as we always turn to at this point, like going forward, you know, I always like to ask as we move forward, not only for, not only for the leaders, not only for the administrators, but for the artists, for the writers, for the actors, for the singers, for those working in the ticket office, for those working mm -hmm. in the funding, you know, all those who, you know, are, you know, expressing the issues like, like, like we are, you know, in your opinion, what, what kind of things are needed to go for, especially now as we move out of this space? Because for me, mm -hmm. my thing right now is across the board is like, okay, there's no excuses after this because y'all done came out, y'all decided to take this moment to come out and be grandiose with statements. No one asked you to, but you decided to. That's from everybody. Like I said, from Nike to Amazon, you, you decided to do that. So, you know, from this point going forward, in your opinion, what are some of the things, not only from the leadership aspect, but from the artist aspect that need to happen as we move flash from this point forward? Well, you know, as you said, the statements are the easiest things to do, but getting behind the real change <laughs> that's going to take time mm -hmm. and demonstration and, um, you know, uh, inviting people into these spaces um, to occupy positions of power. Um, also, I, I know it, you know, the training and the opportunities, you know, um, is it financial resources? Is it cultural differences, you know, where people don't know, you know, if I were a young black artist, you know, say living in San Diego, where would I go? Who, whose door would I knock on? 
what, what organization is set up to say, hey, you know, are you interested? You know, first of all, just trying to navigate the world as an artist anyway. It's, it's, it's not a linear route, you know, it's so circuitous and sometimes you think it's luck, but, you know, people with access to money and resources and, you know, these institutions, you know, with financial resources, I mean, the bottom line is you, you got to have money to put a program together you know, to pay people, to, to train people. Um, I think we need um, uh, more training in business practices, certainly, you know. Um, how about mentorships uh, to teach uh, young black artists producing, mm -hmm. you know? Because, uh, you, know, you know, we're looking for the producers. It's like, where are the black producers? Where are the black casting, you know? Mm -hmm. We know Jacole, we know, you know, it's like, a, a Twinkie Bird, you know, where the where yeah. the black, you know, where the black, you know, directors. I've started to direct. I got hired by UCI uh, Irvine. You know, I've directed my own things, and I never occurred to me. Oh, you know, I actually had a director on set offer to mentor me. I was like, oh, well, okay, why not? <laughs> you know, why not? Um, and and also, uh, it, it's like asking ourselves, why not? And then how? I want to know how Tyler Perry did what he did. Right. You know, I right. want, I'm like, oh, oh, how did Spike Lee do? Oh, you know, we, I think we, we need to start looking at ourselves and saying, we just need to do it. You know, it's, and I'm the type of person, I hate waiting around for people to do stuff for me. It's like, well, let me, let me come up with some money to produce my show. I don't know what I'm doing, but you know, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm making enough money in commercial. I, that commercial paid me real good. I'm going to, here you go. Let's do this show and get it done. You know, I'll get it. I'll get it. And I got it done. Um, I produced my own show last year and uh, I was like, I could do that. So we need, you know, we need that demonstration. We don't, you know, we don't, we're not in the practice of that, you know? So I'm saying, you know, it, you know, I'm working with this man now, you know, he's the board of a theater uh, and he's hands-on and he's like, I want to commit money to making this happen. And I want you to have your own voice. And we're like, I'm like, okay, let's have more of that. You know, and then, and then as black artists, we need to stop selling ourselves short. I can't tell you how many like Shakespeare auditions I would go to. Not a black or brown person in the room. I'm on the phone going, why ain't you down, down here? This is Utah Shakespeare, but you know, this is, they're like, oh, I don't know Shakespeare. Oh, I'm not, I've never done it in front of people. I'm like, get over it. Mm. You're asking for the opportunity, snatch it. I would, I would go into spaces where I'm not in, invited. If it says ethnicity open, I'm showing up to that audition. Mm -hmm. That's why I work so much, because I would show up. No excuses, no excuses. That's right. You're better than that. And you got to get over that thin skin and that self-deprecating kind of, oh, I'm not, you know, because, you know, I can I tell you, I've been in a lot of spaces where I was with directors. I didn't know what they were doing. Mm. <laughs> Don't come prepared, didn't read a script, didn't, didn't take a blocking note. I'm like, come on, really? You're wasting my, I came prepared. I came off book. I did my research. I did all my dramaturgical research. What are you doing? You know, I, get the egos out of the room and let's focus on the work. So I think, you know, I think we really start to need to reframe, you know, I mean, art, you know, the art is sacrosanct as well. You know, I mean, there's got to be a place where we can be safe and, and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, as a black artist, I feel like sometimes we don't have the luxury of making a mistake when we get that opportunity. We need those places where we can do that, where we can look stupid where our writing can be bad, you know, uh, because other people get that opportunity. So we need that as well. And understand that this, it's not going to be, you know, something that we're gonna solve in a year or two years. What's the game plan? Who are the people you're going to support initially who are at a professional level, perhaps, who are producing things, who just need that extra opportunity? Then how are you moving that into education? How are we structuring our educational uh, spaces? Who are we inviting in to be those educators? What other writers are you looking at or developing? What other cultural practices are you looking at? And, you know, uh, and what constitutes classical work in your book? You know, why aren't we looking at, you know, Black South African playwrights instead of Athel Fugard and 
<laughs> in every school, you know, it's, and uh, at, are we looking at dance forms, you know? Are we looking at different types of, you know, the traditions of theater, you know, are, are many, some are music based, some are danced based. So there's, you know, there's a world of, of experience that we need to start availing ourselves to. And especially in our training and in institutions of power. And then how are we as black people creating our own institutions? We have a culture that's built America. Why aren't we building our own institutions and preserving our culture? and valuing that instead of looking outside ourselves to, you know, the great white way. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're talking about the lights, but I have always hated that term. Yeah. Always. Yeah, it's, like from my first day at KSR, uh, it was KSA at the time, then KSR, yeah. now KMR. But yeah. <laughs> from my first day when like Broadway was really now on my radar and a thing for me, Mm -hmm. like the great white way like mm -hmm. it was so telling to me and they're like no nah, it's the lights it's the lights and yeah. now to this day no. I'm like that's nah, no it ain't. no it ain't. it's no accident <laughs> it's no accident <laughs> it's yeah we know what it's celebrating yes <laughs> we know what it's celebrating you know and the the people who are still producing you know the producer on Black Eyed Peas has got like five Broadway shows or something under his name so he's a player and a, a guy I was dating sent my script on to a producer who said to him flat out, black people don't come to Broadway. I can't sell this. So why are we looking to places that don't want us? Right. I don't, it's, so it's, it's, it's not a simple question, Ahmed. I mean, those are just a few yeah. ideas. There are people that, you know, are, you know, are, can articulate that better than I can and have more information that I, than I do because I've, been so long in the service of other people's creative voices, yeah. you know, and now to have the opportunity of stepping into my own creative voice and developing that. And finally to have I've got two artists in residencies coming up next year that are about supporting my creative voice. So, and it's also me understanding the types of relationships I'm allowing myself to be in. So the other thing that's gotten me through is the way that I'm dealing with my interpersonal relationships, my professional relationships have to treat me well, have to respect mm. me, have mm. to hear me. And, and I have to insist on being heard and seen. Yes. So it's two way, it's a two way street. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the types of people I'm going to get into bed with, so to mm -hmm. speak, it's like, you know, what's this relationship? If are you going, how are you talking to me? because I ignored all the signs. I mean, these people that I'm with, I, I, that I dealt with, with that, I should have known better. But I didn't listen to my, my better judgment and my instincts and I didn't protect myself. That's right. That's so right. now I know how to protect myself. Yes. And, and, you know, people don't lie. People, always, people will always tell you or show you exactly who they are. But, you know, are you paying attention? Right, right. I do. I always I, say I found my voice as an uh, as an agent because as an agent I learned how to stand up and speak for other people and to fight for the needs of other people. Yeah. And it wasn't actually until I was done being an agent that I realized that was a transferable skill and that I had that power to do that for myself. Absolutely. New Carol, I do have I have one question. If you could briefly, if if you have an answer for it, it's from um, John Tesmer, oh. and. He just wanted to know, did you spend enough time in Sweden to be able to notice any difference between uh, racism there versus here in the States <laughs> with respect to the performing arts? Uh, hey, there, John, you get the carol. You're coming from grooving up with people. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, oh, no. call, like, flexing on us. All of people <laughs> flexing on us. Like that. I was only there for three months. So, you know, it's it's very little, but I picked it up real fast. It was strange. Um, yeah, there's there's racism in, in Sweden for sure. Um, uh, only a special brand of European racism for us. I met, I was traveling with this group called Up With People when I was a teenager and I was in uh, Jönköping, Sweden for their 500th anniversary. Not a black person on the street and the, the it's swarming with drunk Swedes falling all over each other. And then I hear this, hey, hey, so sister, so sister. And I look 
and there's this tall uh, biracial, beautiful man coming toward me. He had long kind of curly hair and kind of hazel eyes and he's wearing this oversized uniform. He's like, hey, and he grabs me and he hugs me. I'm like, whoa, you know, I don't know you. He's like, oh, <laughs> and he's drunk off his ass. And and so I, sorry, I'm sorry to curse on here. Yeah. No, you can. <laughs> and then uh, he's like, oh, I, I says, I, I don't know any black people and I want to know you. I'm like, okay. And he's like, who are you? And I tell him my name. He goes, where are you? And I told him, you know, I was going to be at this place performing. And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see you. I was like, okay, this dude is not going to remember. He's so drunk. So the next day I'm coming backstage getting ready. And, and someone says, hey, Carol, someone, there's this dude out there in the gym waiting for you. I'm like, who? And I walk out and this guy sitting there in his military uniform sitting up straight completely sober and he goes and he tells me his name and uh the story was his mother swedish and his father was this uh mm. i think black american soldier who left his mom or something like that or they broke up or something and you know he just was terribly lonely because you know experiencing racism as a black man in sweden and you know and he was obsessed with black americans so mm. he he followed me for like two weeks from show to show and you know when I had to leave the country he brought me flowers and he hugged me and he starts crying and he's like I'm gonna miss you so much he says I, he says I just I just want to go home mm. or something like that it just broke my heart and he says you know when you meet someone from another country it's like you might you, it was so corny but it was so cute he says you're not just making a friend you're building a bridge from one country to another mm. I thought oh that's so sweet but it was just like kind of a little insight into you know I just can't imagine what his life was like uh there and um and it was hard to there were very shy people when I was there and I only spoke French and sweet and uh I spoke a little Swedish so um you know, and, and a lot of people were too shy to speak to you. Um, but it was, but traveling through Europe was weird, like in Amsterdam at a TV show, a producer came up and rubbed my head because they ble believed it was good luck to rub a black person's head or something, just weird stuff <laughs> like that. It's just, it was just so weird. Um, but it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not unique to our country. We, you know, and when you think about the people, you know, who colonized America, I mean, you know, it's, that's our legacy, you know, and, uh, but they're just kind of much more, they're much more direct with it. Uh, you know, and they say it kind of like, oh, you're just in you know, normal conversation, you know, oh, you black people are so rhythmic, you know, just kind of like, oh, it's just a charming little thing. Oh, you natives, <laughs> you know, did you sing, did you, oh, I remember, did you sing gospel growing up? You know, did you sing in a black church? Oh, we love the black gospel music and, you know, and they're, tr they think they're being nice and it's just, very odd it's just awkward <laughs> so i don't know if that's an answer to your question john it's probably very superficial but it's not as deep <laughs> well, look, Carol, you know, i want to say you, that um... to people all the time i don't think that's the compliment you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> well, look carol we know you got to get moving in a couple of minutes um why don't you briefly if if you want tell everybody what 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 you're working on or what you got coming up <laughs> uh, well, I just, um, I've been one of the lucky actors to be shooting TV during COVID. I shot a commercial a couple of weeks ago and I am going to be, sorry, I have to turn my phone down and, uh, I'm going, I'm, I have recurring role, uh, as Keisha Williams on Good Trouble. Um, if you are fans of that show, it's great. I play the mother, uh, to Malika, um, so I'm, uh, I'm going to be shooting two more episodes of that. Uh, so look for that this year. And I'm directing a devised piece at University of California, Irvine, uh, with composer Leslie Wickham um, that will be up on the website. Uh, so they're all original songs, three one-act plays over a series of different nights. And I have two artists in residencies at New Musical Inc. to develop a musical called All About Face. And then later on, uh, COVID, what is it? never you know preventing or i don't know uh if we're able to gather do it remotely of my uh at uh noise now at a noise within in pasadena uh my production of rule my world uh with uh local composer alan phillips from san diego so so it's 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 a full year that's 
that's what's up. Amazing. That's what's going on. Yeah, I'm very blessed. And I never take it for granted. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, I, again, uh, on behalf of everybody in this community, thank you for coming to talk to us today. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody, in case you didn't know, her name is Carol Foreman. If you didn't figure that out by now. Appreciate you. Love you, my San Diego peeps. <laughs> Miss you. Make sure you CBC. follow her, check it out. And y'all will be back on October 29th with Gamal Chastin. He is the organizer of the Breath Pro of the Breath Project. Um, and uh, don't, if you missed this conversation, oh. you can watch. Yeah, that's right. I watched. Hey, I watched that. That was really good. Thanks. Really good. <laughs> Bill Wright is the man. <laughs> Bill Wright is the man. Y'all don't know Bill Wright. <laughs> yeah, he's the guy. <laughs> Come on now. Um, hey, y'all, make sure you go to uh, San Diego Rep and La Jolla Playhouse's YouTube page. You can watch all these conversations and make sure you watch the conversation with Bill Wright because that's there. You can also catch these conversations in audio form now on SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. And uh, you wow. got anything for the folks, Jacole? Thanks for listening. <laughs> thank y'all. And Carol, again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're so welcome. I appreciate the both of you. All much right. Love. All right. So Have good a good to night, see everybody. You, we'll talk to you, to you soon. Girl.